Good evening, everybody. Yeah, we're going to go ahead and, uh, and, and get started. We actually delayed the, um, the start of the presentation due to the weather, and I see the people are still coming in. I expect that will continue throughout the, uh, the lecture tonight. But we're going to go ahead and get started. So uh, welcome to the sixth installment of the Beach Institute Lecture and Learning Series. My name is Ron Christopher. I am the Vice Chair of the King Tisdale Cottage Foundation, which is our umbrella organization. It's our privilege and our honor that we're able to bring the series to the general public free of charge. Thanks to the generosity of our members and supporters, and particularly with respect to this evening's event, uh, we'd like to especially thank Savannah State University for its co-sponsorship and the city of Savannah for its investment. So this is how this is gonna proceed. Are we gonna bring up, uh, well, I'm gonna give a, a, an introduction uh, to our speaker. And we're gonna bring up our speaker and she's gonna speak for about an hour. Uh, after that hour, we're gonna open it up for questions and answers. Uh, and that should last about 30 minutes or so. And then at that point, we'll, we'll call it an evening. So with, with that out of the way, let me get, get started here. Our speaker for tonight has been captivating audiences all over the country. As a medical ethicist, Harriet Washington has a unique and courageous voice and deconstructs the politics around medical issues. In addition, to given an abundance of historically accurate information on scientific racism, she paints a powerful but disturbing portrait of medicine, race, gender, and the abuse of power. Ms. Washington also makes the case for broader political consciousness with respect to science and technology, challenging audiences to see the world as it is and challenge the established paradigms in medicine and in the history of medicine. In her work, she focuses mainly upon bioethics, history of medicine, African-American health issues, and an intersection of medicine, ethics, and culture. Ms. Washington wrote Medical Apartheid, of which I'll have more to say about uh, during the course of these remarks. But she wrote that book while she was a research fellow in ethics at Harvard Medical School. She has worked as a page one editor for USA Today, as a science editor for several metropolitan dailies, national magazines, and professional journals. For example, her work has appeared in Health Magazine, Emerge, and Psychology Today, as well as numerous academic publications, including the Harvard Public Health Review, the Harvard AIDS Review, Nature, the Journal of the American Medical Association. The American Journal of Public Health and the New England, huh, New England Journal of Medicine. Her awards include the Congressional Black Caucus Beacon of Light Award, two awards from the National Association of Black Journalists, and a Unity Award from Emerge. She's the founding editor of the Harvard Journal of Minority Public Health and has presented her work at universities in the United States and abroad. Medical Apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on black Americans from colonial times to the present, the first social history of medical research with respect to African Americans, was chosen as one of the Publishers Weekly's best books of 2006. The book also won the National Books Critics Circle Nonfiction Award, a Penn Award, the 2007 Gustavus Meyer Award, and Nonfiction Award of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. It has been praised in periodicals from the Washington Post and Newsweek to Psychiatric Services, The Economist, Social History of Medicine, and The Times of London, and it has been excerpted in the New York Academy of Science update. Experts have praised its scholarship, its accuracy, and its insights. Medical Apartheid was the number one bestseller 
in medical ethics on Amazon. In her latest book, Infectious Madness, Washington looks at the connection between germs and mental illness, revealing that schizophrenia, obsessive compulsive disorder, Alzheimer's, and anorexia may also be caused by bacteria, parasites, or viruses. Weaving together cutting edge research and case studies, Ms. Washington demonstrates how strep throat can trigger rapid onset OCD in a formerly healthy teen, and how contact with cat litter elevates the risk of schizophrenia. Infectious Madness was released in October 2015. In another book, Deadly Monopolies, the shocking corporate takeover of life itself, Washington takes an in-depth, eye-opening look at the 40,000 plus patents on human genes and their harmful, even lethal consequences on public health. Her other books include Parkinson's Disease, a monograph published by Harvard Health Publications, Living Healthy with Hepatitis C, and she has co-authored Health and Healing for African Americans. In addition, Ms. Washington has taught at venues that include New School University, SUNY, SUNY of New York, the Rochester Institute of Technology, University of Rochester, Harvard School of Public Health, and Tuskegee University. She has sat on the boards of many organizations, including the Young Women's Christians Association, the School Health Advisory Board of the Monroe County Department of Health, and the Journal of the National Medical Association, to name a few. In addition, Ms. Washington has also worked as a laboratory technician, as a medical social worker, as the manager of a poison control center and suicide hotline, and as if that's not enough, has performed as an oboist and as a classical music announcer for a radio station in Rochester, New York. Please join me in a warm and welcoming applause to Ms. Harriet A. Washington. I want to talk to you about a very troubled history of the abuse and use of African Americans in medical research. But although I use the word history, this hasn't really ended at all. And one of the things I hope to do is to draw a line for you, showing how historical biases by the medical profession, sometimes in collusion with the government, have created um, disparate treatment and abuse that, that thrives even today. This history is not over yet by, um, by far. We're still dealing with the um, biases and we're still dealing with the abuse. It has a slightly different um, countenance now, but it's the same thing. And, I'm, and I hope to show you by historical examples and contemporary examples how the same things that happened to us 300 years ago are being perpetrated today by the same organizations. I also want to show you how important it is to understand the true nature of science and history. One of the things that we are um, repeatedly told is that science is pure and history is unbiased. And well, you can decide for yourself after you hear me whether you think that's true. But the history, this history could begin in 1619 when Africans were first brought to these shores. But in a way, for me, it began at the end of the world, Second World War. It began in Germany where you had U.S. prosecutors and U.S. physicians had gone to Nuremberg to confront the Nazi ar ar architects of the Holocaust, the Nazi doctors who used medical research as a front for the savage gen genocide of European peoples, Jews and others, including Afro-Germans, who rarely make it into the history book, but I found ample documentation of the abuse of black Germans as well as Jews. But when the, when the U.S. doctors confronted the Nazis. They accused them of abusing people under the cover of medical research. And the Nazis had a very interesting response. They said, how can you point the finger at us when you're doing the same thing at home? And they were doing the same thing at home. In fact, some of the same doctors at Nuremberg who confronted the Nazis were abusing Americans at home in unconscionable medical research. Dr. Andrew Ivey comes to mind. You can read his eloquent speeches in the Nuremberg Code's tra tribunal transcripts, but at home, he was helping to head 
the plutonium experience, where the Americans were injected with plutonium, a fiendishly poisonous substance, radioactive, a half-life of 25,000 years. It means it'll never leave your body. They were doing this to people, and Ivy said, let's be sure to take people who are about to die. So, and he said, we'll do that because they're going to die anyway. It also would have been the case that they convenient would not have been able to, you know, be found liable. No one would ever discover it. But he didn't use people who were about to die. He used people like Ed Cade, an African-American truck driver, 55 years old and very good health. The only reason why Ed Cade survived is that he, in the dead of night, he, he ran out of the hospital. So anyway, these were the people who were the um, moral arbiters of the Nuremberg Code. So we have forgotten our domestic wrongs because they were perpetrated on people of color disproportionately. So again, you know, I, I very often hear, well, you can't criticize science because science is pure. You know, if a scientific fact is exact, it's precise, it's unassailable, right? If it's a scientific fact, you can't argue with it. But that's not true. Science, and especially medical science, is rife with mythology. Unsupported biases and beliefs that may have a political and economic utility, but they have no scientific basis. You can't defend them on the basis of logic. And yet they've become so prominent and they have been unquestioned for so long that we tend to unquestionably internalize them. Even African Americans will believe some of these things. Um, so what we're looking at as medical science is not necessarily science. It's an amalgam of science and bias, including racism. You can only justify it by saying these people were not really people. These people were more like animals. They were not worthy of human respect and dignity. And that's precisely what was done. So you don't find that in history books, though. If you look at history of medicine, you don't see anyone writing that's what happened. And why is that? Well, Winston Churchill said, history is written by the victors. African Americans were not writing histories. In fact, African Americans legally could not learn to read. They were punished for literacy. Not only were they punished, but their owners would be punished. A white owner who let his slaves learn to read in some states was punished as well as a slave. Very, very important that we not achieve literacy. We might read some of these things and you know, contest them, but that didn't happen. So their um, version of things went unchallenged. And who was they? Who were they? They were whites, but it's not the fact that they were white that made them wrong. It's the fact that they were writing things in support of enslavement, even though they weren't true. And by the way, Winston Churchill believed his observation is, is echoed by a Nigerian proverb that said, don't let the lion tell the giraffe's story. That's exactly what's happened here. So science was co-opted. To, pr to portray African Americans as unhuman, subhuman, degraded, with no virtues whatsoever, unintelligent, sexually irrepressible, more and more like beasts and animals than people when it came to sexuality. They couldn't restrain their own sexuality. Um, aggressive, evil, prone to theft, which is actually laughable when you think about it. a people who stole and kidnapped people from their their home country, accusing them of theft is kind of laughable, right? So um, these mythologies are very potent, though, partly because they were promulgated by the best scientific minds of the time, and partly because nobody challenged them, or very, very few people challenged them. So when I talk about mythologies in medicine, you know, the interesting thing is today, when you mention mythology in medicine, typically it's people talking about African Americans' mythology. Uh, for example, when I first set out to write this book, I talked to prominent historians of medicine. They told me, oh, those things never happened. Those are all myths. You know, people believe, they're, believe in conspiracy theories. No one ever abused African Americans. That's not true. So mythology is usually used to cast aspersions on somebody's beliefs. Not just that it's not true, but how credible are you? you know, how credulous are you that you could believe a thing like that? But mythology to scholars means learning something fundamental about a culture. The problem is that it's thrown around very carelessly. And when people dismiss African American beliefs as mythology, they're usually insulting them by saying it's not only not true, but you guys believe conspiracy theories. 
However, I was able to disprove this, and I knew I had to disprove it by using references that everybody would respect. So I went to medical libraries, like Harvard's Countway Library, medical libraries, including Medical College of Georgia, all around the country and a few in Europe, where I found this information. I didn't find any books giving this information. I found a sentence here or there in a medical journal. It was really spread out. In that sense, it was hard to find. But frankly, it was everywhere, partly because in the 17th and 18th century, doctors who abused African Americans didn't think they were doing anything wrong. So they were very open about it. They would write of it. Oh, I tied the slave to the chair so I could cut off his jawbone. He was screaming and protesting, but I did it. You know, They were quite proud of these things. So it was not that hard to document. So what did I find? I found some really interesting things. One of the arguments put to me was, you can't say that planters, slave owners, and doctors didn't want African Americans healthy. They wanted healthy workers for their farm, right? They want, you want somebody who can work long and hard and do what you need to have done. They need that free labor to be healthy. But what I realized was that health and fitness for work are two different things. You can be fit for work and insane. You can be fit for work and riddled with parasites. You can be fit for work and profoundly depressed. You can be fit for work and have chronic diseases that completely ruin your quality of life that no one's addressing because you can still pick cotton. So this is actually a myth. There's, it's a myth that they wanted slaves to be healthy. What they wanted slaves to be was fit for work. And fitness for work included reproduction. Reproduction was actually work for an enslaved person work that they were forced to do, just like they were forced to pick cotton. And um, the evidence for that is actually everywhere. Slave owners were very frank about the fact that they wanted fertile women and potent men, because they needed the more children they generated, the greater the wealth of the planter. That's one more slave he didn't have to buy. Thomas Jefferson wrote, I consider a woman who gives birth once every two years as profitable as the best worker on the farm. So that was another source of income for them. In fact, enslaved women gave birth three years earlier than white women on average. And they suffered far more complications of birth, not only because they didn't get, they got substandard care, but also because they were in such terrible health to begin with. Slaves were routinely starved. Um, a historian named Kenneth Hafel has written a series of uh, monographs detailing the diet of slaves. And the diet of slaves was abysmal. Um, they were racked with um, deficiency diseases. So the health of the slave was secondary. No one really cared about that, as long as they could work. And um, there was also a belief that the bodies of enslaved people were profoundly different from that of white people. That belief was an economically necessary belief, and we'll, I'll ch tell you why in a minute. Because of scientific racism, this is not just racism, a term that is defined differently by different people, whites define it differently than what blacks do, for example, but scientific racism was very precise. It was a, a system of belief about the bodies and minds of African Americans promulgated by the prominent scientists in the US and Europe. And they believed that the bodies of African Americans had very, um, were so profoundly different, that African Americans were a different species. Only a few prominent scientists of the time thought that whites and, and blacks belonged to the same species. And even then they said, yes, blacks are the same species, but they're profoundly degraded. They will never catch up to whites. So basically, they did not think of us as human. And scientifically and medically, we were not human in the canon of American medicine. That's what the textbook said. That's what the medical research journal said. They're not, we're not truly human. And there are a lot of other differences as well. But between the interest in fitness for work, the belief that we weren't human, and the rise of animal husbandry and taxonomy, categorization of animals, slaves were treated <coughs> exactly the same way. They became categorized. There's a taxonomy of humanity as well. And black people always fell at the bottom. Different schema, but somehow black people always fell at the bottom. And blacks and Africans were considered to be the same people, which frankly, for a lot of the history was true because many slaves were native-born Africans still. So um, we had a situation where there was a lot of impetus for planters and also, for reasons I'll explain later, 
for doctors and medical scientists to embrace the inferiority of African Americans. Now, this might lead you to think that these medical scientists were especially venal people, you know, very evil, racist, but actually their behavior was constant with that of other people in the U.S. at the time. During enslavement, um, you know, our country's law stipulated that it was legal to buy and sell people like cattle, to treat them like animals. Uh, chattel slavery, you actually owned another human being. Uh, the laws did not protect them. <laughs> African Americans were not citizens of any country, and so they didn't enjoy protection under our laws. But, so medical enslavement was simply a part of that. Medicine treated people the exact same way. Enslaving them, forcing them into clinics and checks to be experimented on, that's part and parcel of the enslavement that was a law of the land. And then later, during segregation, when the law of the land was allowing separate but supposedly equal facilities, um, that was medical law as well. There were inadequate, um, profoundly degraded um, provisions for African American health that came nowhere near supplying their needs. And African American and whites were kept in hospitals when blacks were allowed in the hospitals as separately, as one scholar said, as if they had, were living in two different countries. So it was only part of American de jure segregation. And today, when disparate access marks a lot of our institutions, everything from educational institutions <coughs> to housing, segregation has actually gotten worse rather than better in this country since the laws passed to ban it. Um, so now we have medical disparate access where African Americans do not receive the same quality or appropriate health care as do whites. So medical researchers were neither worse nor better than anybody else. It was part of the American mentality. And this is just the listing of the chapters in the book. 15 chapters dealing with 15 different um, spheres of medicine. And believe me, there are originally much more. But my publisher said, this book is going to cost $100 and weigh 20 pounds. You've got to cut it. Right? So I did. But there was much more. I, I offer it because there will be a test, a quiz later. No, I'm kidding. I offer it because <laughs> I want you to see the scope of this. You know, we're not talking about the Tuskegee study. We're not talking about um, Dr. Sims abusing black women. We're talking about four centuries of abuse in every conceivable sphere of medicine. So I heard from people who said, you don't expect us to believe that doctors were actually um, buying and selling slaves to do research on them. I said, read the papers. That's what I did. I found newspapers from the 19th century in which doctors were putting advertisements in the paper. Sick Negroes, your slaves can't work? Send them to me. I have use for them. And they would, without ever asking what you're going to do with them. And um, so the medical colleges would advert advertise for them, private doctors advertise for them. It was, again, a very above board um, market in African American bodies. They were not embarrassed by it. They thought it was perfectly appropriate then. I don't, you may have read um, recently that the, the statue of Dr. James Marion Sims in Central Park was finally taken down by the city of New York, 10 years after I wrote about it in my book. And who knows who Dr. Sims is? He's important, but he's important because he is such a good example of an American doctor who has been lionized as a hero, but whose advances were predicated on the savage abuse of African Americans male and female. But in terms of the women, what he did was he took women who were suffering from vesicle vaginal fistula and he said, I'm going to cure this disorder. Vesicle vaginal fistula is a horrible, horrible complication of childbirth. Um, I won't go into detail here, but basically a woman ends up with openings between her rectum, vagina, and bladder. She's incontinent, horrible situation, infection, Recurring infection is the norm, so she's constantly ill, constantly infected, incontinent of urine and feces. It's a horrible situation. And if you read Victorian literature, every once in a while there's a reference to some poor woman who's kept in the attic and can't go into, into you know, society. That woman often had vesicle vaginal fistula. So for a moneyed white woman of the South, this was a tragic and devastating disorder. But it struck more slave women than white women. And Dr. Sims was ready to put an explanation why. 
He said, it strikes more slave women because everybody knows that slave women are whores. We all know that these are sexually irrepressible Jezebels. They will have sex with anybody. They're dirty. And that's why they end up with this horrible condition. But Dr. Sims was wrong. It was caused by enslavement. These women had vesicovaginal fistula because A, they were so young. They were giving birth at a very young age, as I mentioned before, earlier than white women. B, they, were, they also were vitamin deficient. Vitamin D deficiency causes, as everybody knows, rickets, bone disorders. It causes the pelvis of a woman to become flat and shallow. It won't allow the baby's head to progress during childbirth. And the baby gets stuck there, eventually dies, but before it dies, it has already eroded all the tissues so that the woman ends up with these openings. And, and also, so it was malnutrition caused by deficiency, causing deficiency disorder, and maternal youth. And the fact these women were being forced into sexual relationships so early, before they were ready, that's what caused it. So it was enslavement that caused it. But in the medical journals, and Dr. Sims, and all the other doctor peers and scientists, all agreed that it was black women's sexual, uh, they called them Jezebels, sexual irrepressibility that caused it. Really interesting, that, that um, belief was very um, prevalent and very old and very useful because black women's sexuality was also blamed for the birth of all, all the mulattoes. There was an explo explosion of mulatto births, <coughs> excuse me, on plantations in the uh, Victorian era. And the doctors and scientists were quick to explain that's because these black women are constantly enticing white men into inappropriate sexual relationships. <laughs> Not that the white women were raping them, but they just wouldn't leave their white masters alone. Okay. So, that was the theory. But it, this was in all the medical journals. This was, this was a, a point of medical knowledge. So, what Dr. Sims did was he decided he was going to do, a, do surgeries perfect a cure for vesical vaginal fistula, surgically repair it, but he only used black women. And he was not the only one. They, all of doctors doing this only use black women. Why would they only use black women? Because white women could say no. Black women could not. Simple as that. So, you might ask yourself, I ask myself, how can they justify taking black women, locking them in a shack, doing repeated surgeries on them without anesthesia, very painful, very degrading surgeries, often in front of an audience. Dr. Sims himself wrote that he used to invite friends to watch and other doctors to watch. How can they justify that during the Victorian era? These are Victorian gentlemen who are supposed to revere women, protect women. Well, the reason why they could do that was because white women and black women were two different species. Black women were considered to be the complete opposite of white women. White women were sexually chaste, but fiercely protective mothers. Black women were held to be sexually loose and murderously indifferent mothers. So every, all, the, all the maternal virtues only ascribed to white women and all the maternal um, evils were laid to the, on the feet of black women. And lest we think we have outgrown this thinking, it's very prevalent today. Um, you know, in the early 20th century, you have a quote there from the government of South Carolina, black women can't be raped. This is a sentiment that still is very, very prevalent. Um, you can see it in the laws. How many, how many African American women were raped by black men during enslavement? It boggles the mind. You don't even want to try to calculate it, right? 300 years of chattel slavery during which black women had absolutely no protection, no legal protection against white, white masters when mulattoes were being, were being born quite prodigiously. And yet, how many rape cases were brought against southern men, southern white men? 10. So, I need hardly say that none were one, right? So the fact is that our laws still don't recognize the ability of black women to be raped. This is actually worse among Native American women. Um, one of the horrors of our, that's still prevalent is that on Native lands, on reservation lands, if a Native American woman is attacked by a white man, she can't sue him. She can't take any legal action against him. 
because the laws of those lands don't extend to whites. Unfortunately, unconscionable white men know this, and Native American reservations have become hunting grounds for rapists. Um, the law, you know, they've tried to overturn the law several times. They've gotten everywhere, in, as we know, where the last time they tried to overturn it, state um, U.S. senators, not state senators, actually came to hearings to argue against it, saying we can't have you know Native Americans, you know, pushing their laws onto whites who come onto the on the reservations. So this belief that women of color are you know fair game is something that's very deeply entrenched and very um, persistent. Got some stats here. 90% of Native American women who are raped are raped by white men who cannot be prosecuted for the crime. But getting back to African Americans and medical science, these doctors here um, are all people who are considered medical heroes. No question about that. If you look at the literature, they're always being lauded as all the great things that they did. They're great humanitarians. However, every one of their um, laurels is based on the abuse of African Americans. I want to draw your attention to Talia Powell Clark, John Heller, Raymond Vondelier, Thomas Perrin, Eugene Sanger, and Oliver Wenger. They all have something very important in common. Anybody know what that is? I hear some murmuring. <laughs> they all experimented on black people. They certainly did, but there's something even more specific. Eugenics. That's true, but there's something even more specific. These are the men who put together the Tuskegee syphilis experiment. Oh. But I want to ask you this. Who knows who um, Eunice Rivers was? Eunice Rivers? She was the black nurse charged with keeping track of the men. More people know about her than know about them. And these men put together the experiment, and Thomas Perrin became Surgeon General. When he became Surgeon General, he declared that eradicating syphilis was going to be his, uh, you know, his goal. That was, that was going to be his great accomplishment. He used his um, Office of the Bully Pulpit against syphilis. And guess what? They did find a cure for syphilis on his watch. And when they found it, they asked him, OK, we know penicillin will cure syphilis. Are we going to give it to the men in the Tuskegee study? He said, oh, absolutely not. He said, we need to finish that study. They represent an opportunity that will never come again. So we need to keep them infected. So these are our medical heroes. You know, we have a penchant for calling people a medical hero based on what we think they have achieved. We don't look at how they've achieved it. No one questions that. The fact that they achieve it based on abuse of people of color is not an issue for us, apparently, which is really unfortunate. And that was the case with James Mary and Sims, too. So Sims had um, done experiments with these women for five years. The surgeries were very painful. Uh, he had to cut their genitalia every single time and then sew it again, suture it again. And after five years, he, found, he finally found how to do it. And he immediately left Alabama. Didn't linger to cure the women. He immediately left, went to Paris, came to New York, where he became like the toast of the Academy of Medicine. He found national fame and fortune, became the president of the American Medical Association. And the statue across the street from the academy was erected to him. Several of the statues across the country were erected to him. There is one in Paris put up to him as well, and he's considered a medical hero. So when I exposed him for who he was, and 10 years later, the people who lived in the area where his statue is in East Harlem were successful in getting the city to take it down. That was, to me, it's a very important symbolic victory. But, <laughs> very happy about that. But I'm a fellow at the Academy of Medicine, and I was, I have to admit, I thought nothing would surprise me at this point. I have been a little bit surprised that my colleagues, some of them, you know, a group of older male surgeons will not forgive me for this. You know, they're still, fighting this battle. They're still defending him. You know, I thought, you would think they'd want to distance themselves from someone like him. But they're still insisting that he did nothing wrong and that um, I and the people who have protested against him, I'm trying to rewrite history. And I say, I am trying to rewrite history. I'm trying to correct it, you know? But there's resistance still. Kind of a sad tale. <laughs> 
So these scientists I've been talking about, the ones who promulgated the beliefs about African Americans that made it possible to treat them so um, cruelly and inhumanely, they had a name, the American School of Ethnology. And these were like the most prominent scientists in the country. Some of them had international fame, and they all agreed that African Americans were degraded and subhuman, not a member of the human species. They also said that African Americans had diseases and conditions that whites did not get. One of them was pellagra. They said it's an infectious disease caused by filth being dirty, and it only affects African Americans. Actually, pellagra was yet another deficiency disease that African Americans got because they were being starved. And we learned that only later on when economic problems in the South caused poor whites to get it as well. But still, despite research showing that it was not um, a racial disease, it took 20 years for the medical system to accept that fact. They insisted on um, believing that it was a racial disease. They needed to believe that. Also believe that um, African Americans had diseases like um, Drepetomania, Struma africana, Dysesia ethiopica. These diseases were characterized by things like, um, what's drepetomania? That's the most infamous one. I know somebody here knows what it is. Drepetomania? Tendency to flee. Hmm? Tendency to flee. Out of control over desire for freedom. That's right, running away. A slave who ran away had drepetomania. If you're a slave in ancient Greece or Rome, running around might, might be logical, but in in America, if you're black and you ran away, now you've got a psychiatric disorder, a diagnosis, right? <laughs> and the punishment was to take you and some really affected people out into the woods and beat you and make you work very hard, beat you, and basically bring you under control. That was the treatment. In fact, doctors would write, give him, give this runaway slave nine drops of essence of rawhide. This conflation of treatment and punishment was something very common in medical journals at the time. So all these doctors had these theories about um, illness that only affected blacks. So other symptoms were things like refusing to work, refusing to follow your master's commands, talking back to a white man, breaking a master's tools. So what do all these diseases have in common that struck black people? A lack of enthusiasm for slavery. You know, if you didn't do what you were told to do and do it in the way you were told to do it, you were considered sick. What did it mean when you were considered sick? Well, it was psychiatric disorder. You know, you're considered crazy now, and you're treated with violence as a means of treatment. So is it any wonder that African Americans had a, you know, a suspicion of medicine when they were subjected to a perversion of medicine that entailed punishment? So, um, there were also, in addition to the diseases, there were also immunities. Okay, I'm trying to find it. Okay. Immunities. <coughs> Slaves are also immune to certain things, the most important of which I think is pain. What does it mean when you say that somebody does not feel pain or they don't feel pain in the way that normal people feel pain? You're implying a certain insensitivity. You're implying a certain lack of human feeling. Very often when you refer to someone as being insensate to pain, you're questioning your, their humanity. I've noticed that arguments um, pro-choice um, pro that tend to, that want to send, seek to support abortion will make a point of saying the fetus doesn't really feel pain the way pe humans feel pain. That's a way of dehumanizing the fetus. So the belief that African Americans did not feel pain was a very important belief. Also they felt that African Americans didn't feel anxiety or mental disorder or didn't get heart disease for the same reason they don't feel pain. The belief was that African Americans' neurological system was so primitive and so crude that they did not feel pain or feel anxiety. African Americans did not feel fatigue. They didn't get tired. They didn't suffer heat illness. They didn't have heat stroke. After all, they came from Africa where it's hot all the time, right? So why would they have heat illness? They didn't get malaria. They didn't die from yellow fever. What are all these immunities? What do they all support? I'm sorry? If you're a planter and you're confronted with lands that need to be tilled and worked in the hot sun in a malarious climate, what better gift than someone who was made by the creator 
to be able to work long hours without getting tired, who wouldn't get malaria, who wouldn't get yellow fever, who wouldn't feel pain, who wouldn't feel fatigue. And if, and if black person said that they felt, they felt sick, they, they said they have malaria, I have yellow fever, I feel pain, what did doctors do then? They simply said, he's malingering, he's lying to get out of work. In my book I talk about a doctor who actually wrote his master's thesis on how slaves would malinger and, and say they were sick in order to get out of work and how to find out how to expose them when they're shamming illness. So there was no escape for a slave. Even being sick and dying was no excuse. You know, no one's going to believe that you're ill. They're going to think you're shamming because they've been told by these scientific minds that you don't get sick, that you don't feel fatigued. So why would scientists go to such a length to support enslavement? Why would doctors want, want enslavement? What, what would it matter to them? Doctors were dependent on slaves, treating slaves for their income. It was a different profession than today. People, doctors did not make a lot of money back then. They didn't have like high hope social status. Their only way of surviving was to treat enslaved people, get a contract with a landowner, a slave owner, to treat his slaves. That's, and Josiah Knott even said, Josiah Knott's one of the doctors here in this um, American school. He even said that um, the best practice is that among slaves. So because they were dependent on, sl on slave owners, they also promulgated these beliefs that supported enslavement. They needed enslavement to, to um, have an, for economic reasons, just like the South needed enslavement for economic reasons. So um, also, many black doctors were slave owners. So we might be tempted to say that, okay, these beliefs we've, are things that we thought back in the 1800s, we left all that behind. Have, have we really left it behind? Do we still think that there are black diseases? And are they really supported by the science? Is sickle cell disease a black disease? Most people think it is, including some doctors, including a lot of African Americans, but it's not. Being at risk for sickle cell anemia is caused by living in proximity to the Anopheles mosquito. If you come from an area where the Anopheles mosquito was prevalent, then you are likely to have one or both alleles for sickle cell disease. And that is because sickle cell disease, although it's a horrible disease, painful, shortens the lifespan in this country, if you live in an area like that, sickle cell disease actually is protective against malaria. Having people with a trait for sickle cell in those areas live longer and have better health than people who do not. So people without the trait and people with the disease tend to die sooner than people with the trait. The trait is protective, and that's why people in Iraq, parts of Asia, many of the parts of the world also have sickle cell disease. But there is a mythology that's very prevalent in this country that it's a black disease only affecting African Americans. Not true. Um, there are many, many examples today, but crack babies is probably the best one. No logical support for it, but that did not keep reams and reams of journal articles being published in peer-reviewed journals attesting to the ravages of, of crack babies, um, how they were devastated, tiny golems, children who could never become fully human. I, th I thought that was really telling. Couldn't become fully human. Where have I heard that before? In the Victorian era, right? So newspaper headlines everywhere 20 years ago raged about crack babies. I remember one headline in New York Times, like the size of a headline for a nuclear war, right? <laughs> crack babies invade schools. I'm like, what? The kids were growing up and going to school and they were worried about what would happen to the other students. It turns out there is no such thing as a crack baby. There's an article published in Teratology that looked at the articles that had been published and found out that they were illogical and they were mistaking the consequences of living in poverty for the consequences of being a crack baby. But you know, you didn't have to be a scientist, epidemiologist. It wasn't logical. Think about what a crack baby was. A crack baby was a child born to a woman who had, at some point, used crack cocaine. Whether she used it once, or whether she used it every hour, her baby was a crack baby. It wasn't predicated on the clinical picture of the child, but on the behavior of the mother. And yet, this is something that was promulgated for a very long time. It took years to dispute to 
unbridled this myth. And there are many, many more. One I just finished writing a book about has to do with um, the belief that African Americans have low, um, lower IQs than European people, European extraction. Um, 15 point IQ gap is laid to, by heterotarians, laid to an innate lack of intelligence. This belief has been around at least since the 1500s and um, probably earlier than that. And it's a very, it's um, a favorite belief. People really want to believe this, but it, um, there's so many flaws to it. First of all, the testing is deeply flawed. Even if the testing were actually accurate, you can only say that it's uh, an inborn condition by ignoring the disparate conditions into which African American children are born. You know, African American children are born, more likely to be born in poverty, but more than that, they're more likely to be born in an environment where they're assailed by environmental toxins constantly from birth on. Toxins that are known to lower intelligence, mercury, iron, phthalates. Um, the recent publicity over Flint has opened our eyes to that, but the whole country is made up of flints. And the whole country, you find a very sharp racial disparity between who's exposed heavily and who isn't. So these diseases and immunities are very um, persistent. They haven't gone away. We still, medicine still believes them. And there are economic bases too to these beliefs. Now, I mentioned that doctors during the um, Victorian era did not make a great deal of money. They weren't high status professions. and after a while, by the, I would say probably by the 1830s or so, um, white doctors in the South were really becoming ups upset by competition. Who were they in competition with? Black doctors. These people didn't have MDs, but most white doctors didn't have MDs then either. These were African herbal men, midwives, people who had brought their um, knowledge of medicine from Africa or had trained their um, pro, you know, protégés in medicine. And what happened was that they were treating a lot of people because slave owners did not want to call in the expense of white MDs until they had no other choice, until the slave was almost dying, right? So they would call in these doctors who actually had a better record of healing in certain um, areas like childbirth. Black uh, herbal men and midwives were so much better at um, birthing children that white people, white women, were, preferred them. They they liked uh, they preferred black doctors because, first of all, they didn't use forceps, which were new and in use, and not every doctor was skilled in them. And also because they had methods that were that worked better. The children delivered by black doctors tended to live longer and have fewer complications, fewer illnesses, and whereas. White doctors would come and deliver a baby dressed in their dirty street clothes without washing their hands. African midwives had a tradition of scrupulous cleanliness and using very clean rags to attend the birth, so they had fewer infections. White doctors did not take kindly to the competition. And what they would do very often is, if a black doctor became too much of a problem, they would have the doctor accused of poisoning and execute him. This happened not only in the South, but in New York City. The doctor here at the state is a doctor named Tony. This happened in New York City. Um, he was accused of poisoning when one of his patients died. And um, testimonial after testimonial from white doctors would cast him, oh, everyone knew that he was a trouble. Everyone knew that he you know, wasn't very, you know. And um, no, no evidence, just testimonies, and he was executed. This happened very, very often. Also, African, you know, white house, households that had slaves. Our history books don't do a good job of showing us how frequent were slave insurrections. They were very, very common. We hear about what Nat Turner <laughs> once in a while, but the reality is that many white households lived in fear of their black employees turning on them. And many black employees and households had dual roles. I'm a woman might be the cook, but she's also the nurse who cared for the family. So it was very easy for her if she decided to, to poison the whole family. These kind of things happened all the time. So um, there are a variety of reasons why physicians wanted to get rid of the competition um, and were very uncomfortable with, with black healers. And that's what happened in the Victorian era. Look at what happened in the 1960s. Um, civil rights era um, had a really interesting component, and that was black doctors refusing 
and nurses as well, um, rebelling against their treatment in the medical profession. Um, I and my co-authors wrote an article in JAMA, Journal of American Medical Association, in 2008 where we detailed this mistreatment of black doctors by the medical establishment. And I was, no one was more shocked than me than a week after the story was published, the American Medical Association issued an apology to the nation's black doctors for the centuries of abuse. And what did they do, these black doctors? Well, first of all, they refused to admit them to the AMA. And then, when black doctors who could not get admission to white medical schools decided to open their own medical schools, there were at least 13 at one point, probably more, but 13 that I've documented. And then the Flexner Report was generated by the AMA. The AMA commissioned Abraham Flexner to look at all the nation's medical schools and those of Canada and decide which ones were good and which ones were substandard and should be closed. Guess what? He found that every black medical school, except for Howard and Meharry, was substandard and should be closed. They could no longer get funding after that, and they all did close, except for Howard and Meharry. So af even after black doctors began getting admission in small numbers to mainstream schools, even then they couldn't get into residency programs or, or advanced training or research programs. So they began protesting the AMA as a racist organization. And um, really interesting, for example, in Atlanta, the AMA had the, their annual meeting at the Traymore, I think, a hotel that did not admit African Americans. So when black doctors went to the meeting, um, the hotel said, you can't be here, it's against the law. They refused to leave. The AMA <laughs> sat by while they the hotel called the police and had the black doctors let out in handcuffs. So that's why the black doctors were picketing the AMA meetings, just like people were picketing lunch counters. And, and essentially, at the end, the AMA acquiesced, uh, agreed to stop, you know, barring the entrance of black doctors um, and opening up residency. So it was a success. But this is all things, these are all things that happened within the memory of a few of us here, you know, in the 1960s. And even today, the, um, numbers of black physicians are still too low. They're, lo they're larger than they were before, but they're too low. And what, what really concerns me most is the number of black male physicians. It's at, the percentage has actually gone down. 1974 was the peak year for graduating black uh, male physicians. So we still have a long way to go. And today, we have our own brand of scientific racism. We still use black subjects disproportionately in non-consensual research and non-therapeutic research. By that I mean research for which that is not going to benefit the person. Some research can be of benefit to you. Other research will only hopefully benefit somebody else. That's the kind of research that African Americans are often um, involved in and not always informed. When I was a patient in Columbia Hospital, um, I had a medical emergency. I'm signing the forms for my treatment and I suddenly realized that one treatment has the word experimental on the form. So I whipped out my laptop, looked it up. Sure enough, it was an experiment. And I said to the doctor, why did no one tell me this is experimental, this procedure you want to do on me? He said, oh, well, people, he said, you wouldn't really understand. <laughs> you know, you need to save your life. You need not to question us. Who are you? And I said, I'm the person who need, you need to sign this form. That's who I am, you know, and I'm not signing it. So. <laughs> And I was discharged without treatment. Thank goodness I wasn't dying, you know? But it's, this happened in like 2002, right before I started my program at Harvard. So these things still happen. You know, these African Americans are still, you know, coerced into treatment or tricked into treatment. And um, I'll talk in a little bit about a law that has made it easier to do that. Um, there's also, you know, a belief in African Americans is not only having bestial sexuality, but as being bad parents. And being bad parents has serious implications for um, African Americans. Um, one of them is that for white women, reproductive freedom means access to, to technologies, like abortion, you know, being able to elect whether or not someone's going to take out your uterus. And those are all very important uh, freedoms to be able to have. But for black women, Hispanic women, 
Reproductive freedom means being able to stay out of jail because they are disproportionately um, prosecuted and jailed for poor birth outcomes. When, when your baby dies, when your baby is born very sick, seriously underweight, clinging to life, very frequently um, the Klieg lights go on to these mothers asking, what did you do? Did you use drugs during your pregnancy? Did you drink during your pregnancy? And the onus is on you to prove that you didn't. Should they be able to prove that you did, you did in fact have a hit of crack? Oh, that's it. Now you're prosecuted under various laws that fall in the rubric of delivering drugs to a minor. Not what the drugs were, not what the laws were made for. They were made for other, you know, people who actually gave drugs to young people. But they used those drugs to prosecute women with bad birth outcomes, whether they had anything to do with drugs or not. So um, black women have are facing um, serious legal um, implications for this disparate treatment, for this disparate perception of them as bad mothers. And in terms of black women, he would like to mention that this. Recognize these two women, anybody? Who they are? No reason you really should, but it's interesting. These were the two doctors on Delta flights who, when they offered to help a patient who was seriously ill, were told, sit down, we're looking for real doctors. They wouldn't accept their credentials. Now, the first one, Tamika Cross, what she did was, uh, the patient was in serious distress. They didn't know if she was dying, having a heart attack, or what. And they called for a doctor, and she sprang up, offered herself, and, she was, and the flight attendant says, oh, sit down, honey, we're looking for real doctors. She said, no, I am a doctor, you know? And so the flight attendant scrutinizes her uh, credentials and says, what were you doing in Detroit? She said, there are doctors in Detroit. I mean, <laughs> what does it matter? This guy is dying, you know? And she wanted to go help the patient, and the flight attendant restrained her, wouldn't let her go. Meanwhile, a white guy jumps up and says, I'm a doctor. The flight attendant does not ask him for any credentials. He goes and he starts helping the patient, but at some point he's outside his, how could I put this politely? At some point he needs help, and he turns to the black doctor, who verbally tells him what to do since she's still not allowed to go help the patient. So this deep skepticism of African and women, American women as healers, which of course extends to black men as well, but it's very interesting, it shows us still um, a mentality that's, you know, quite disturbing. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this, but there are persistent views about the inherent criminality of black men. Uh, Cesare Lombroso in the 1920s wrote a book called Criminal Man, and he said, some people are just born criminals. You can't treat them, you can't cure them, you can't change them. For example, the Dinka of West Africa, and he cataloged all these nefarious behaviors of the Dinka, supposedly, that showed that they were like typical Man, and then he went on to say, and of course, African Americans in the U.S. are the same kind of people. So, in one fell swoop, he indicted all African Americans as born criminals. And since then, there have been a number of studies, including um, genetic studies in the 1970s, really widespread one in Baltimore that took 15,000 black boys trying to show a chromosomal basis for their violence. Then it was repeated in New York City and in Chicago. There has been a consistent search for a violence gene in black men. Um, in 1998, around the time I came to New York City, they were doing a study on young boys from 6 to 11 years old, also looking for a criminal gene. So this um, persistent search for a criminal gene that will allow them to indict black men is only the latest manifestation. They're only looking for a biological um, underpinning for this persistent belief that black men are inherently criminal and violent. So, I mentioned before that in the 19th century they thought that um, African Americans didn't feel pain. You've got these doctors going on about, oh, my patients, black people don't feel pain at all. Even doctors, even doctors in London held this belief. And again, you would think that we had outgrown that, we don't believe that anymore, but no, we still believe this. Only last year a survey showed that 50% of medical students believe that African Americans felt less pain than whites. And a large percentage of doctors in practice believe that as well. They also believe that African American bodies were different than white, that African Americans were more resistant to radiation and needed higher doses than white do, whites do. So all these beliefs have not gone away. They still constitute part of American medical 
um, beliefs, and this mythology is very prevalent and is going unchallenged. The surveys periodically show it, but who's addressing it? What's being done about it? Are any penalties being um, deployed against people who have these beliefs? Has training been escalated to encompass them? Not often. Some places like the University of Chicago did indeed institute additional training for medical students, but most medical schools frankly ignore these findings. How are we doing on time? I don't want to try your patience too much. <laughs> Okay, thank you. All right. So, belief of black men as rapists, which, frankly, I don't want to be too sardonic here, but when you have black women who are subjected to constant physical assault, assault on the plantation, it's kind of weird to think that black men are the ones being indicted as rapists, but that's exactly what's happened, and it continues to happen, and it's been medically sanctioned. You know, um, physicians continually wrote in the, um, up till the early 20th century about that. And you still find people writing about this. Frank Lidston, a physician um, maybe 40 years ago, he said that um, not only were African-American men more likely to rape white women than other men, but since all African-American men had STDs, this act was often a death sentence for the woman. These beliefs were actually the basis for lynching because the belief was that um, the women had not only been raped by a black man, but had been irretrievably polluted by that black man, and they wanted to spare her the agony of testifying to this act on, on the stand, so easier just to execute him. And of course, part of this belief in the deg degradation of black men is the belief that they were absent and different fathers. Uh, that basically sperm donors, they cared nothing about their children. And again, if you go back to the 18th century and 19th century, you find these long-winded but unsupported by evidence um, speculation about why that is. What, it is about, what is about African and black men that makes them completely indifferent to their children? No, one's try no one has proven that, but they're speculating about why this is the case. And today, what we see is like just, um, so many casual references to it that go unchallenged. You know, it's not a matter of anyone um, offering scientific evidence. It's a matter of it becoming a background belief. Um, for example, when I was a social worker, people would all often re refer to, um, oh, African-American men, you know, we need to get child support because they're not going to support their kids. One woman actually told me, well, Hispanic men care about their kids, but African-American men, they won't do anything unless we make them, you know? And it's infuriating. You know, what's your, where's your evidence? Everybody knows it. That's, that's your evidence, right? But then a study done um, some years ago showed that African-American men are actually more involved in the daily day, day life of their children, even when they're not living in the home. You know, absentee fatherhood is an American phenomenon. It's something that is very common in this country and elsewhere. But for men who don't live with their children, African-American men are more involved in their daily life. So who was actually the, abs you know, the absent father, the one who um, callously abandoned their sh children, showed no interest in their welfare, even consigned them to slavery? This guy. Maybe I'm the only one with a sick sense of humor. I love this cartoon. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it's sardonic, it's sick, but let's face it, it's true, right? <laughs> I mean, these were <laughs> slave owners would father children on black women, the children would take the, um, interestingly, took on the status of their mother and became slaves. So they're consigning their own children to enslavement with very few examples. So I submit that this is a classic absentee father whom we should be castigating. So the belief in bad mothering and bad fathering, African Americans, um, underlies eugenic control of reproduction, which as I mentioned before has been very, um, virulent when it comes to African-American women. Um, they were more likely to be given a sentence of either jail or nor plant. When, con when convicted of a crime, they were said, okay, you can go to jail for eight years or you can have this contraceptive implanted under your skin that will keep you infertile for a minimum of five years and we won't send you to jail. So jail or nor plant became the sentence. And the vast majority, 85% of the women sentenced that way were black and Hispanic. 
also, I don't know if any of you see it, saw this, a few years ago these began circulating, these little posters, telling the world that the most dangerous place for an African American child was in the womb. So again, a bad mother, you know, you're someone who is more likely to have an abortion, so their, their claim goes, and so you're a danger to your child. And I remember these, um, a, nice, a little group called, um, what were they calling themselves, Crack? Children Requiring a Caring Community. A community that did not include their parents, apparently, because they were paying drug addicts not to, to uh, take contraceptive, to um, get Norplant implanted, and nasty little headlines like, don't let a pregnancy ruin your drug habit, show the depth of their disdain for these people. Mm -hmm. So instead of compassion for someone with a drug problem, instead you're castigating them. Um, and even headlines in the New York Times would say, the, we're talking about parents of crack babies, parents who prefer drugs to their children. That's how little they care about their children. And all of this is very well, very well documented and powerfully told in Dorothy Roberts' book, Killing the Black Body. I highly recommend it if you want to understand the plight of women, and co women of color in this country when it comes to reproductive freedom. So I'm going to skip ahead a bit. I wrote a book about the commodification of American medicine and how um, it, used to be, it used to be dictated, the kind of drugs that we had and what they cost used to be dictated by people who had a, had a mission for healing, medical researchers who wanted to be benefactors. I want to find a cure for polio. You know, I want to um, cure cancer. But now it's corporations who are maximizing the dollar. So they're interested in promulgating only drugs that will maximize their profits. They're not driven by the drugs that people need. They're driven by the drugs that make a lot of money. And that's why we have 20 drugs for erectile dysfunction and almost nothing for people who suffer from malaria in the developing world. There's one case study I just want to tell you about. This is an interesting case. There, sleeping sickness in Africa used to be a disease that once you fell unconscious, rendered unconscious by the disease, there was no bringing you back. So there were a lot of drugs, and some of them were very dangerous. You know, some of them were drug or compounds, like one was made of arsenic and antifreeze, you know, that would as likely kill you as kill the pathogen. So very bad, we needed more drugs for sleeping sickness, right, and finally they found one. This one, they called the resurrection drug, it would actually bring you back once you fell unconscious. It was saving lives, it was a perfect drug, side effects were not bad, it worked really well, and then it was yanked from the market, why? because Africans could not afford the price tag. Years later, I'm watching TV and I'm seeing a commercial. <laughs> a little embarrassing, but this really happened. I'm watching this commercial that says, Fenicla, eradicate your facial hair without razor. And I need to get that, right? <laughs> so I did, went to my doctor, I got a prescription for Fenicla. I said, oh great, I'll use that. No, no more mustache and facial hair, you know. Okay. I get it and I look at the tube and I see that in Vinica it's a fluorinathine, the exact same drug that was curing sleeping sickness. I thought, what's going on? I called a friend at Doctors Without Borders. She said, oh yeah. She said, look, she said, it is the same drug. She said, she said they're charging you $50 a month. I said, yeah, that's right. I said, the $50 a month from you is they can't get $50 a month from people in Africa. So they've withdrawn it from Africa but you can still get it to get rid of your facial hair. They can't buy it to stay alive. And sure enough, that is the truth. Doctors Without Borders supplied the drug for a while, but they couldn't keep it up forever. And now, you know, of course I stopped taking it. Ethically, I couldn't support that company, right? But um, so now Western women are getting rid of their facial hair where Africans are dying of sleep sickness for lack of the same drug. And I think it's a perfect example of what's happening with drug um, commodification for the commercialization of research and drugs in this country. And I want to wind up to talk about something very important, which is when I talk, I'm often told by other experts in the audience, yeah, but there are all these laws now protecting people. And we have the Nuremberg Code. Nuremberg Code protects nobody. It's a beautiful document, beautiful ideals, but there are no penalties. It's toothless. It means nothing if you violate it. The laws that have been passed, some of them were protective, some of them actually rolled back protections we already had. And one law, the one I have in red, 1996 Amendment, 25 
CFR 50, look it up online. You know what this law says? It says people in this country can be used for medical research without getting their consent in certain cir circumstances, and it details what they are. One of these studies that did that, I found 20 studies that have done that. There are studies going on right now where people are enrolled without their knowledge or permission. But this study in polyheme was going on when I wrote the book, so I wrote about it in Medical Apartheid. You want to know more about it. This study actually was of artificial blood carried on ambulances. If you were shot in the chest or in a car accident, you're a trauma victim, ambulance pulls up. Instead of treating you, they take a minute to open an envelope, which tells them whether they give you standard of care or an experimental modality called polyheme, the artificial blood. So, it's totally by chance. If they give you the artificial blood, they kept data on who you were and how you did. In the end, when the data was collated, most of the people who got the artificial blood were people of color. In the end, when the data was collated, the people who got the artificial blood were more likely to have a heart attack or die than people who got the standard of care. Not one of them was ever told they were in a research study. They died in a research study they never knew that they were in. I mean, if the ambulance comes to treat you, who's going to think they're doing an experiment on you? I certainly wouldn't if I didn't know about this. So this is where our country is going in terms of informed consent. We're rolling it back. We're going in the wrong direction. We have to be very vigilant about that. And, okay, the actual last thing I'm going to say is that genetic technology is powerful and important, and it does very good things, but use it with care. If somebody wants to take a DNA sample, think carefully. It may be the best thing ever happened to you, but, we, but keep in mind that we don't know everything that can be t determined from a DNA sample yet. There are tests that have not been devised yet that may give information that you don't want given out. Also, keep in mind that DNA information pertains not only to you, but can tell people about your children, your parents, and other people in your family. Recently, a man who signed up for 23andMe and gave a sample, that sample was used to convict his brother of a crime. His brother's in jail right now. So he thought it was 23 to me. In this case, it was 23 to life, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not saying don't do it. I'm saying be careful and think about possible consequences when you do it. And um, the same technology that's being used now to exonerate men from prison, very good thing, right? These are mostly African-American men uh, convicted of assaulting white women. But that technology is also used to um, create databases, which are a collective presumption of guilt. The databases are full of black and Hispanic men and they're going to check those databases when they're looking for a criminal in the future, they could end up incarcerating many more men than have ever been sprung by the technology um, to the heartfelt products on TV. And I'll actually stop now. Thank you so much for listening to me.